Today on episode 52 of First Chapter Freak Show, we're diving into L. Marie Woods' The Realm. Let's get it started. Hey everybody, thanks for joining me on episode 52. I'm your host of First Chapter Freak Show, indie horror author Carver Pike, and I'm excited to be back with episode 52. We're on a roll. We've passed 50. We're not nearly close to 100, but we're making our way there, and I've got enough authors, I think, to make it to 100, so um, we're going to make it there, man. And as I keep adding authors, because I've had authors reach out to me, we are well on our way, and I'm excited about it. People seem to be enjoying the show. We're picking up a few new viewers, it seems like, every episode. So we're slowly and steadily growing. Seems like people are liking what they're seeing, and that's exciting to me. So as long as I can entertain somebody a little bit, I'm excited about it. I'm having a good time with you guys. And um, I love sharing the books. It's fun to read. I might fuck up and fumble over my words a little bit from time to time. But, hey, that's all part of the fun, right? You guys get to watch me have a little bit of egg on my face and screw up from time to time that's all part of the game right so um so yeah i'm sure you'll see me do that a little bit today so as i said i'm carver pike what i do here is i read the beginnings of my horror author friends books you listen to what i read and hopefully you like what you hear if the author's new to you hopefully you'll go check out their work on amazon or godless or barnes and noble or wherever they're selling their stuff and check out their work there and uh you know read through it do your due diligence make sure that um their writing style is, you know, what you like to see, that their books are grammatically correct or that the flow is what you like or what you enjoy, because sometimes hearing it, you know, um, may not be the same as actually reading it yourself. So make sure to check out their work and stuff like that. And hopefully you'll like what you see and you'll pick up their books and, and pick up everything they write from here on out. That's the idea here. As you've already heard, I've dropped an F-bomb once tonight, so just make sure you don't have little ones in the room or anyone else who has sensitive ears or, you know, doesn't like foul language and stuff. Um, I don't know what I'm reading tonight. Uh, Elle Marie Wood, I don't know if she uses foul language in her books. I'm not sure. Uh, she might. She might be the most extremist, sickest, uh, nastiest author on the planet. I don't think so, but we don't know, right? So... Uh, you never know with this show. I've read some really sick, disgusting shit, so just be careful. So we'll find out, though. But I, I don't think that, that Lisa's work is, is that foul and disgusting. Definitely probably not as bad as, as the Aaron Beauregards and Daniel Volpe's and, and, the, and the Simon McCarty's and stuff. And, um, you know, some of my work and you know, some of the stuff that's out there. So, But uh, anyways... We're going to get to her work a little bit. We'll find out, right? So, what's going on? Um, Faces of Beth is doing really well. Thanks to you guys. You've been so amazing, man. So, I've got some copies here. The books have been coming in. and I've been getting them ready to ship out. You can see I've got the paperback here. Faces of Beth. Um, I'm going to read you the blurb, even though I've been told somebody said that this was a shitty blurb. But I have to agree, I'm not the greatest at writing blurbs. I need help with that. I need to start paying somebody to just rewrite all my blurbs, because I'm not the greatest with blurbs, man. And especially with this book, because I didn't want to give much away, and it was really hard. But the blurb is, When Andrew meets Beth at the Miles Bend State Mental Hospital, he knows she has issues. She checked herself into the place because of her problems, but he can't help falling in love with her anyway. He's willing to put up with her constant mood swings and all the baggage she brings into the relationship. He'll help raise her kids, give her siblings a place to stay, and even look after her creepy grandfather. After all, he has the space in the huge house left to him by his parents. Marriage has its hardships, Andrew knows that, but there seems to be something else wrong with Beth. A dark entity grows inside her and he can't help wondering if she might be possessed. Andrew can look past all the other drama in their new life, but the thing inside her that seems to want him dead, that's kind of a deal breaker. So, yeah, I've been told that the blurb needs work. <laughs> so, but it's on the book. It's already gone out the way. It's on the ebook. book um, I like the blurb, but I guess it, the from what I've been told, the book is so much better than the blurb. So hopefully you'll listen to that and, and check the book out. So it is kind of a possession story. 
Um, I can't say much without ruining it. And it's one of those things that it's crazy to me that when you watch movie trailers, they give so much shit away. They tell you everything that's in the movie and then you still go see the movie and you enjoy it. And I guess I could go that route, but it terrifies me to give everything away to my book just to sell the book. But it's kind of a catch-22 because I know that I'm suffering not selling the book by not giving everything away to sell the book. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Like, movie trailers give everything away, and people still line up to buy the tickets and buy the DVDs and stream them. Do people buy DVDs anymore? I buy DVDs. I like having DVDs. But, you know what I mean? People still buy the movies or rent them, whatever. Watch them. Stream them. And trailers give away pretty much everything. So, at what point do you just give away your storylines? At what point do you sacrifice your stories and your twists and shit like that to sell the book? To sell the story? I don't know. It's a good question. I wish I could master the art of writing the perfect blurb. And I know there are people out there, like there's one company or <clears throat> one woman on Facebook. I don't know if it's just one person or if it's like her or she has several people working for her, but I think her name is the Blurb Fairy, something like that. So I know there's people who do this kind of stuff, write blurbs for people. I don't know if it actually works or if it's worth it, but I know people are out there doing that as a business. It may be worth it for me to just pay somebody to write the blurbs. I definitely need to work with that. But anyways, the point of what I'm saying right now is to tell people thank you. I started out saying Thank you to everybody. If you're on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or Twitter, if you're anywhere and you're sharing my stuff, if you have the paperback and you're showing pictures of it, if you are showing the cover of it on your ebook, Faces of Beth, if any of my work really, but right now it's Faces of Beth, of course, that I'm talking about and pushing. If you are, by word of mouth, talking to people and just telling people how much you like the book or you're posting in Books of Horror or posting in any of the Facebook groups, um, and on your wall and stuff like that. You have no idea how much that means to me and how much it means to every other author that you're doing that for. That's the stuff that really helps us and sells books. We can go out there and post it ourselves until, we, until we're blue in the face, and it doesn't mean as much as five other people posting it. Um, and it's not the same as, like, if I were to build a street team. Back in the day, I used to do that kind of stuff especially in the romance world. You know, I would have a street team of like 20 people who every time a book came out, you know, they would help me out and they would go do that kind of stuff. And and it's not the same when people are doing it because they, you know, they don't have to. I mean, they're doing it because they want to. You know, they're, they're, you know, readers of yours, fans of yours, and they want to help you out and stuff like that. But when when it becomes more like a business strategy and stuff like that, it doesn't work the same as, when people are doing it because they love your work and they really want to help you. So I appreciate all of you guys that are doing that kind of stuff. It, it really, from the bottom of my heart, it means so much and it really is helpful. Um, every, every share, everything that you do. So please keep doing that kind of stuff. It really helps. Um, you know, talk to your local stores and tell them you want faces of Beth in the store. That kind of, that would be awesome. Um, you know, post and whatever you're on TikTok, Instagram, that kind of stuff. You know, it takes two seconds. If you don't know what you want to post for the day, help hold my book up and stuff. That stuff just helps a lot, and it's really awesome. And, you know, it could mean one sale for me, but that could, you know, could show five people who'd never heard of me or had never seen my book could present that book to them. You know what I mean? So it all means so much. So thank you so much for everything that you do. Speaking of influencers, I did last week, showed you my friend Jason, who... um was did the review of grad night so this time i'm actually going to be showing you marianne some uh, probably all of you know marianne marianne is a hoot she's so funny she's so fucking cool witty hyper energy man i don't know how she has the energy like i i bought joe rogan's alpha brain to see if it would work because i just i take so many medications for all my back issues and neck and leg issues and all the stuff that i always feel like i'm in a brain fog I have such a hard time concentrating most of the time. And I don't know that that alpha brain shit works. Whatever Marianne's on, I need that because I need I need Marianne brain. <laughs> Instead of alpha brain, I need Marianne brain. I need that. Whatever she, whatever brain fog medicine she's on, that's what I need. 
But because she's just so fucking cool, man. She's always like just so excited and high energy. I got the chance to meet her at AuthorCon and Jules and I met her and Jules was like, we should be friends. And right away she was like, we're going to be best friends. And they just sat down together <laughs> just right there on the floor next to my table and just started talking. And they're, and they're like great friends now. Anyways, she's so cool. But she's actually done a lot of videos She's on Facebook. She's half the team of the Mothers of Mayhem podcast with Christina that that uh, did the quote of the week, la the book of the week last week. Um, so she does the podcast with her, and it's an awesome podcast. If you haven't listened to it, you really should. This Mothers of Mayhem podcast, that's badass. You really got to check that out. And um, so she is on, I'll put it up here in just a second, but it's, she's on TikTok and Facebook as tf underscore did underscore i underscore just underscore read so it's like the fuck that i just read so um she once she did a video for my first diablo snuff book a foreign evil like a while back and then in the video that i'm going to show you right now check this out she's showing the inscriptions it's really funny a bunch of the inscriptions that she really likes and she mentions one that i did for uh, discovering ivory in a charcoal cave but she's showing inscriptions that she's had in her book, some of her favorite inscriptions. And it's really funny. And you can just see her, like, kind of witty sarcasm and her, you know, how happy-go-lucky she is and stuff. So check this out. So last week, Slam and Sammy Hawkins asked me to show some of my favorite inscriptions. And here we are seven days later, and I'm finally doing it. Let's go. First, we're going to start by establishing that Grady Hendrix is the best at book inscriptions. Because <laughs> the man just knows what's up. His inscriptions make me laugh every time. Especially this one because when I asked him to sign it, I asked him to sign it this particular way and I told him it was an inside joke between me and a friend that that was a lie because I actually really do hate this book. I hate it. I hate it so much. It's so boring. <laughs> I'm sorry, Grady. Please do not, don't tell him that because I would like to um, remain friends with him. <laughs> Lucas Milliron is very special to me. I consider him a very good friend. Um, this inscription in particular always gets me every time I look at it. And I love this book because he sent it to me. He also sent uh, illustrations, original illustrations to go with it. So I love this. Dear Laura by Gemma Moore is one of my all-time favorite books. Um, this might not be particularly personalized, but I got to meet her last weekend and it was a huge highlight of AuthorCon for me and I treasure this. I just love it. And she's so, so beautiful <laughs> and so sweet. This is The Death List by Tommy Clark. And I mean, honestly, the man just gets me. He knows what's up. I love everything that I have that's signed by my sweet Spaghetti Bonetti, but this one makes me laugh my ass off every time. <laughs> I'm dogs. Carver Pike is simply an absolute prince among men. Um, this inscription just proves it. What a sweet human being. It was amazing getting a chance to meet him in person. I'm looking forward to giving him and his wife, Julie, the biggest of hugs, hopefully very soon. I had the absolute pleasure of getting a bunch of Mallerman books signed last weekend, but uh, if you are a personal friend of mine or you were at AuthorCon last week, you understand why this particular inscription resonates so very hard with me right now. <laughs> Damn it all. Just kidding. We're thrilled. <laughs> More info on that in the future. Heck. All right. So tell me Marianne isn't just awesome. She's just so cool. So we're going to move on from there. So also after doing that last week, I also moved on to the book of the week, the horror book of the week. Now, of course, this episode is all about Elmarie Woods, The Realm. That is what the spotlight is on this week. But I also wanted to do something where I let my Facebook reader group, the Carver's Block, um, participate a little bit in this in this show. So I thought it was really cool to reach out to them and say, hey, you know, 
let's take turns and you give me a book of the week that, that you enjoy, you know what I mean, in addition to the one that I'm reading from, because the ones that I'm reading from, we just cycle through those and stuff. It's not because uh, anyone picked it or anything like that. I'm just, I'm, it's open to everybody and stuff. So you decide as you listen to it whether you like it or not. So reaching out to my reader group, I'm asking them for the book of the week. And so this week, Mary Danner jumped in and she's so awesome. She, she's such a big part of the horror book world. And um, she gave me a quote for this week. And this is her quote. She's so cool. She said, my horror book of the week is Fear by Ronald Kelly. I read Fear in 1996. I had read other horror books before that, but Fear was the first one that really flipped the horror switch in me. It's both relatable and terrifying. I'm horrified of snakes anyway, even tiny little garter snakes. But a flesh-eating snake that feeds on children? That's awesome and terrifying. I didn't sleep for days after I read that one. I've been all in on the horror ever since. Thank you, Mary. Mary's such a dedicated member, man. She, I gave her like no notice again, like I had to do with Christina. I just kind of put her on the spot and, and reached out to her and asked her for, uh, you know, her horror book of the week and a quote, and she did it like on the spot. And you know what's so cool about that too is she mentioned Ronald Kelly's uh, fear, and I'm listening to that right now in audiobook, and I can vouch for that. That that book, if you haven't read Fear by Ronald Kelly, you should be reading it. Like, the book, the audiobook, anyways, the narrator's phenomenal. Um, I, it's, it's really cool, man. I like it a lot, so I'm having a good time with it. And, um, and Ronald is such a, a nice guy. He's so inspirational. He's, he's been around for a while, and he, he knows the craft. He's such a gentleman. Uh, you should definitely be checking out his work. So thank you, Mary, for uh, jumping in and taking care of that for us. I really appreciate it. And if you want to be involved in helping to choose the book of the week, just join my Carver's Block reader group on Facebook. Uh, the link is down below with the rest of my links. So let's turn the attention back to Elmarie Wood. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Elmarie Wood is an award-winning psychological horror author and screenwriter. She won the Golden Stake Award for her novel The Promise Keeper. Her screenplays have won Best Horror, Best Afrofuturism, Slash Horror, Slash Sci-Fi, and Best Short Screenplay Awards at several film festivals. Wood's short fiction has been published in groundbreaking works, including the Bram Stoker Award finalist anthology, Psycho Rax's Daughters. She is also the founder of the Speculative Fiction Academy, an English and creative writing professor, and a horror scholar. Learn more about Elmarie Wood at www.elmariewood.com. Elmarie Wood has a new book coming out in a few weeks, The Tryst. It's a dark romance, sci-fi, all the things, she says. Uh, and her novella, The Black Hole, just came out. It's a novella and screenplay that's available on her website and on Amazon. Um, uh, I'll have the links available below, so just check below the video where I put all the links, and I'll have the links to... Um, the Trist, I'll have the link to The Black Hole, to all of her work basically down there. So, um, Elmarie Wood is also, I, I call her Lisa because that's what she goes by on Facebook, but Elmarie Wood is also, uh, she's a member, a member of the Horror Writers Association West Virginia chapter. I always get marble mouth trying to say all that together. It's almost like a tongue twister. The Horror Writers Association West Virginia chapter. She's a member of that. I haven't had the chance to meet her yet, but I do look forward to it. I'm sure we're going to meet at a meeting or something like that here soon. Most of our meet, all of our meetings really have had to be canceled because of COVID and things like that. So at some point, I'm sure we're going to meet up and, and I look forward to that. So um, now I did mention that Lisa is the founder and president of the Speculative Fiction Academy. So I told her I would mention it here. As with any kind of class or course, do your due diligence. So check it out. I'm not sponsoring, recommending, or anything like that, but Lisa is the president of the Speculative, Speculative Fiction Academy. It does look pretty cool. I checked out the website. The site says, learn the craft from active writers and academics in a flexible online setting. Study, engage, immerse yourself in speculative fiction. The Speculative Fiction Academy provides an environment where people interested in creating in the genre space can flourish. Students will be able to learn about the things that interest them, fairies and vampires, warlocks and shapeshifters, and everything in between. 
They will learn world building, character development, pacing and tone, as well as marketing concepts, branding techniques, publishing practices, and audio considerations. So check it out. The website is speculativefictionacademy.com. All right. Now let me read you the blurb for The Realm. You thought you were dead. Waking up and looking all around you, you realize all you learned about the afterlife was a fantasy. You don't know where you are, but you do know it's not pleasant or it's not a pleasant or suitable place. You need to run hard and fast. Eventually, you meet others doomed to live in this terrifying realm with you. Here are gathered the newly dead from all over the universe. A formidable race of giant beasts hunts them, the likes of which have never been seen by those in the living world. This place is like nothing you ever learned about in life, neither heaven nor hell, neither purgatory nor shell. You encounter clusters of people huddled together for safety. You're a lone wolf. They don't trust you, nor you them. Perhaps with good reason. Patrick is key to the future of the realm. He must right old wrongs and fight against all the terrors it has in store. He must fight to save his family and, most importantly, all of his descendants. His revelations will impact the living world as well as what comes next. Patrick is the future of humanity. Can he succeed? All right, so that's the blurb for the realm. Sounds interesting. Let's go ahead and dig in now. I'm going to go ahead and turn on my Kindle here. Let's see. All right. I'm going to take my glasses off. Chapter 1 It didn't happen the way they said it would. No angels came to greet him. No bright light funneled a path through the darkness. No relatives called to him from the beyond. He didn't feel warmth, acceptance, or love. He felt emptiness. He saw nothing in the moments before death, just an impenetrable darkness that crowded his vision like oil spreading in water encroaching on the faces of his son and daughter-in-law, blackening them, obliterating them. He could hear them after his eyes dimmed, standing open and blind like black holes. His tear ducts dried up as his son cried over him. The sound of Doug's grief, the guttural moans roiling and meshing with his pleas, his barters with God to save his father, was more than Patrick could take trying but failing to lift his hand from his side and stroke his son's head patrick silently prayed that his hearing would dissipate as quickly as his sight had patrick could only imagine what doug and chris were seeing as his body broke down in front of him images of eyes ruined by broken capillaries filled with blood his slacked mouth allowing a discolored tongue to peek through tortured his mind he struggled for every breath now death's grip holding fast and firm the thought of the kids seeing him fight for air, his face a twisted mass of pain and effort, upset him more than he thought it would. Death was not pretty. Doug moaned and Chris cried while Patrick's eyes grew drier and his skin grew paler. He thought it would never end, the display, the sick, cruel game death was playing. That he should witness it, that he should have to hear the calmness his son usually displayed crumble and fall away, was torture if ever there was a definition of the word. The devil, then. It was his work, after all, he supposed. He was on his way to hell, and this was but a taste of what was to come. And then there was silence, utter silence. The sound of his son's anguish was gone, mercifully. The hum of the respirator, the clicking of the rosary beads the man in the next bed held, the squeak of rubber soles on the sanitized tile floor as the nurses and doctors hurried to his side. All sound had disappeared. He wondered what would be next to go. His memory? He quizzed himself just to see if it was already gone. What's my name? Patrick Richardson. How old am I? Fifty-nine. 
Was is more like it, he corrected himself. After all, he was dead. Dead. Gone. Finished. Patrick stood in the pitch-black silence, confused and unbelievably sad. He was dead. He would never see the baby that Chris was carrying, his first grandchild. He would never watch another boxing match with his son and friends over beer and pizza. He wouldn't get the chance to watch the waves break on the shore from a beach chair in the Caribbean. He wouldn't do anything anymore. Not eat, drink, or fuck. Ever again. Because he was dead. And death was dark, impenetrably so. How did this happen? he asked aloud, using a mouth he could no longer feel. He thought back to that morning when he was ta when he was taking out the garbage. He could remember walking to the back of his house and getting the garbage can. The damn cat had gotten into it again. The little stray he left food and water for had knocked the top of the can off, torn through the garbage bag, and gotten to the trash inside. The little monster made a hell of a mess, too, strewing soggy newspaper, chicken bones, and juice cartons all over the brick patio. Patrick remembered cursing out loud and casting his eyes around the backyard looking for the cat. He remembered turning back to the bowl he'd left out the night before and finding it full of food. That's what you were supposed to eat, damn it, he'd said as he bent down to clean up the mess. On his way back into the house to get another garbage bag, a piece of the dream he had the night before came back to him. It hung in front of his eyes like a transparency over real life, framing everything with the hazy film of familiarity, all soft edges in anticipation. Deja vu. As usual after those dreams, the dark ones that made him wonder if he was there, really there, walking, talking, living with them, he wondered if he was the character whose face the audience never sees. The memory was faint, as it always was the morning after, but he knew what happened next. This time the scene was identical to his dream. There was usually something askew, some crucial piece off-center, but this time nothing was out of place. He knew he would turn away from the door instead of going inside to get the garbage bag. He knew he would squint from the sun when he did, and that he would place his hands above his eyes, shading them like a visor. He knew it just as well as he knew his name, for as easily as that knowledge came, it dragged heavy fear and worry in its wake. He obliged. It wasn't like he had a choice. Patrick heard a shriek coming from the next door, pulling him away from the dream world and into the land of the living with a jolt. It came from Mary Williams' house, an old lady who lived alone despite her diminished vision and limited use of her legs. She got along fine, though. She cooked her own meals and cleaned her own house. She hardly left anything for the day nurse to do. Spunky old girl, Patrick remembered thinking. I hope I'm as with it as she is when I get to be that old. Something cold took up residence in his stomach, grafting itself to his insides and pulsating there. The shrieking voice didn't sound like Mary's, though. It sounded younger, more vibrant, less gravelly and weathered with age. It was probably the day nurse, Jennifer. With a sigh, Patrick detoured from his front door, crossing his lawn to mount Mary's front steps. The old girl might have kicked the bucket, he thought, as he approached the door. He felt genuinely saddened by the idea. The dream was dissipating, and Patrick was happy about that. Sure, he could still feel it playing along the edges of his consciousness, enticing him to come back to play. But it would lose this time and evermore. Patrick knocked on the door and called out to Jennifer, Mary's nurse, announcing himself. The door was ajar, and the force of his knuckles pushed it open. Patrick walked inside hesitantly, calling for Jennifer all the while, but there was no response. He called for Mary then, wondering if something had happened to the girl instead. Nothing. Two steps into the foyer and Patrick could see into the living room and dining room on the opposite side of the hallway. There was no one in sight. Patrick remembered thinking he should leave, thinking that he had been hearing things. But why didn't they answer? And why was the front door open? That Jennifer's car was in the driveway didn't register in his mind when it happened, but Patrick could remember it as clear as day as he recounted it. If he could do it all over again, he would do the same thing. He was sure of it. What happened was just meant to be. He went into the living room, intending to walk through to the kitchen and into the family room. If they weren't in there, he would go upstairs and check the bedrooms, then 
in the backyard. If he still couldn't find them, he would call the police. Mary rarely went out of the house, even with Jennifer's help. She enjoyed sitting in her backyard or in the window facing the road. Parks can't give me any more scenery than my backyard can, she always said. And I even get a glimpse of a handsome young man with his, with his shirt off from time to time. Patrick snickered at the thought. At least he thought he did. Him, a handsome young man? Right. Young wasn't a word that was being used to, to describe him anymore, at least not by the women he dated. Distinguished? Maybe. Vibrant? Sure. Young? No. But he kept himself in shape, enough that he wasn't ashamed to walk around with his shirt off. The sun on his back always felt good to him ever since he was a kid working in the yard with his dad, and hell, if you looked hard enough, you could almost see his six-pack hiding beneath the layer of skin that stubbornly refused to flatten out. So if Mary liked to sneak a peek at him, she could go right ahead. Patrick almost made it through the living room when the shot rang out. The bullet punctured his chest, immobilizing his left arm and driving him to the floor before he could take his next step. He never saw the man who shot him, never saw what he had done to Mary and Jennifer, their bodies tied to the dining room chairs that lined the wall of the kitchen, out of view from the picture window in the family room. All he knew was the hot, searing pain in his chest that seemed to burn his insides and the blood that poured from the entry wound to wet his skin with its warmth. Patrick remembered the feeling of the bullet tearing through his body, seeming to seek out a place to rest. To destroy. He woke up in the hospital to Doug and Chris's face, faces tear-streaked and raw. There was more wrong with him than he thought. He could see it in Doug's eyes. His son, always the cool and collected one, always the optimist. He could find a silver lining in every cloud, but not in this one. This time he saw a rain cloud for what it was, knew the storm was coming, and when it was over, nothing would be better for it. And then, where the hell was Joanne anyway? Wasn't she supposed to have met him at the pearly gates when he died? Patrick thought bitterly. Doug and Patrick had lost Joanne ten years before to breast cancer. Patrick liked to imagine that she would be there waiting for him when it was his turn. He thought she would come for him, would ease him away from life, his pain dissipating as he looked into her beautiful eyes. That's what they said would happen, those preachers he had listened to and believed over the years since Joanne died, the ones he clung to desperately, needing to believe they knew what they were talking about. So where was she? Where was his mother, his father? What about Jennifer and Mary? They were dead too, weren't they? That's what Doug and Chris were talking about when he came to. He remembered hearing his son, his level-headed boy, cursing God for letting his father walk into that house. What about them? Surely they would come to greet the man who tried to help them, who died because he cared. But he was alone in darkness. Anger coursed through him as he searched the pitch for something, someone. And then profound sadness overtook him as rapidly and completely as his anger had. His son would raise his child to remember his grandpa instead of actually knowing him. A prayer would be sent up for him on holidays and his birthday for as long as Doug was alive. But after that, there wouldn't be anyone left to remember. His would be just another headstone at a cemetery overgrown with weeds, just an old picture in a dusty frame of a man his granddaughter and grand great-grandchildren would never know. Patrick had ceased to be. He felt lightheaded. No, he corrected himself. Lightheaded might be what he would have felt if he were still alive, still in the body that had walked the earth for 59 years. He longed to feel lightheaded. He wanted it so badly that he allowed himself to think it was what he really felt, but he realized with more poignancy that he would have liked. He didn't, f that he would have liked. He didn't feel anything. Nothing at all. That's the end of chapter one. That was awesome. That was amazing. Lisa, that was really, that was excellent. And I'm definitely intrigued. Alright, so I'm definitely going to stop there in the interest of time. And I don't want to give too much of the story away because I like how it left us there. So that was excellent. That was the first chapter of The Realm. 
by L. Marie Wood. Thank you so much, Lisa, for trusting me with your words. I hope you guys run out, check out her work, buy that, and check out her books that are upcoming and her stories that just came out and all that. I'll have all the links down below. All of L. Marie Wood's links will be down below in the description of this video, as will all of my links. So please check out all of her work and my work. It'll all be down there. And as usual, it is time to spin the wheel. But don't just take off as soon as you find out the next book we're reading from, because remember, I also want to show at the end of the video, if you didn't see it last time, I'm showing reviews at the end of my video with some music going along with it. So I've been showing some reviews that have popped up for Faces of Beth. Please read those because somebody took their time to write those reviews, and I appreciate them so much. Those reviews mean a lot to me, so please check them out. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and spin this wheel and let you know who we'll be reading from in the next episode. It looks like... All right, this one's been on here a while, so I think that's good. We're going to be reading in the next episode from Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent by Jennifer Ann Gordon. Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent by Jennifer Ann Gordon will be our next read. And replacing that on the wheel will be Conduit by Angie Martin. Conduit by Angie Martin will be replacing Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent by Jennifer Ann Gordon on the wheel. So we'll be making, I'll be changing those over here shortly. And let me see here what else we've got. Oh, so as always, if you want to have your book run the show, please reach out to me at carverpike at gmail.com. Email me or reach out to me on Facebook and I'll tell you how to do that. We'll get you added to the list. The list is pretty long, but as you can see, it goes pretty quickly. We've read oh, 52 books now, so that's pretty cool. And um, we'll continue to do that. So also, if you are a horror author or aspiring author, or if you're a reader and you just like to hear all about the ins and outs of the indie horror author world and like to discover new authors and stuff like that, we've been doing interviews now. Uh, upcoming, we're going to be doing Matt Shaw here soon. Uh, the interview on Written and Read podcast. That's the horror reader and writers podcast that I do. I'm one of the co-hosts with Aaron Beauregard, Daniel J. Volpe, and Roland Bercy Jr., I'll put the link to the YouTube version of that down below this video, and you can listen to the podcast pretty much anywhere that you listen to podcasts. That's about it for this video, but again, don't miss the reviews that I'm about to show you, please, because I want to say thank you to Brian Boyer, who left a, um, a review for me. He is a badass horror author himself. I'm actually currently reading Flesh Rehearsal, this one of his books, and um, if you haven't read his work, you should definitely check it out. He's... He's got an awesome style. Uh, check out his work. You don't want to miss it. It's really cool. And I also want to say thank you to the Amazon reader who left the, the review that's just titled Family is Family. Uh, it doesn't say a name. It's just as Amazon reader. So thank you to that reader. And thank you to Donna for her review as well. Donna L., you kick so much ass. I know exactly who you are, Donna L., and you know that I know who you are. And that is a fucking phenomenal review. I love it. I love all my reviews. So this time I'm showing the three reviews together. I'm going to keep showing reviews. Right now I'm focusing on the Faces of Beth reviews because that is my new book. But I'll go back and, and keep showing older reviews and stuff like that. I love doing that and um, I really appreciate it. So thank you so much and I will see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.